It's Sunday night, and we are back to our study on the spirits in prison. And what we're doing is we're trying to uh, study the book of First Peter uh, in relationship to the spirits in prison. We found out some things about the spirits in prison. The Bible speaks of the spirits in prison in verse 19 of chapter 3 of First Peter. We've been in this subject for, I think, six or seven months on Sunday night. Uh, as I've said before, most preachers can't find enough to fill up 10 minutes on the spirits in prison because they have no idea who it is. But whenever you're going to study something, you have to take a verse, look at every word in the verse, and look at every concept in the verse, and look at the verses before it and the verses after it, and look at the chapter and look at, the, at what it's talking about all through these verses, and then you'll begin to see what you'll begin to see what the writer is talking about. Uh, I've studied some on First and Second Peter, and the writers say that these two books were meant, they were written, the second book was written to complement the first, and uh, we're talking about the spirits in prison, which is the Gentile elect church. Of course, the word prison there in, in uh, the 19th verse of the third chapter is the word phulake, P-H-U-L-A-K-E, L-A-K-E. And phulake, there's many words for prison. And now, I'm not going to go into it now, but there's other words for prison and for uh, locking someone up and guarding. Uh, you've got the word tereo, T-E-R-E-O, and that means to guard, guard are to guard from loss. And when the Bible says, uh, when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That always puzzled me when I was a kid. I thought, how can anybody do all the commandments of God without breaking them? That's not what that word means. No one, we're debtor to do the whole law. If we break the law in one point, James says in the second chapter, we're guilty of all. And who is guilty of all? Well, all of us. We can't keep from it. This word tereo, it has to do with a guarding, and uh, this uh, it means to guard against loss, and it means to keep the way they are. Whenever we keep the commandments of God, it doesn't mean you don't sin. It means they're written in your heart, and you refuse to have them changed. You say, look, this is the law. I know it's true. God wrote it in my heart. Whether I can do it or not, that's not even the point. The point is, His word is true. That's when, and I will fight to keep the purity of the Word of God in not only in my heart, but in this book here. And that's why I do not like the, I do not, I am no fan at all of the NIV, which comes out of the West Cotton Hort text. I believe it's a corrupt text. 6,500 words are in the King James, which are not in, or actually in the Texas Receptus that are not in the, <coughs> that are not in the West Cotton Hort text. <coughs> Was that something over there, somebody? <coughs> I'll go out there and see if everything's all right. Somebody just step out and look. All right. Now, and you have the word phulake, and you have the word phulaso, P-H-U-L-A-S-S-O, phulaso, and we'll get into that word later. But phulaso, uh, is a, it, it is a derivative of the word phulake. It means to tie up, or we may get our word, I'm not really sure, we may get our word lasso from that. I'm not... I'm not positive, but I'm just kind of... Usually words go back into the ancient world and they go back to Greek language. I wouldn't swear to that, but I, sometimes I see these things and I, and I wonder if that's not where it comes from. Well, the word phulake, you've got many words. Paul would speak of being a prisoner of Jesus Christ and he talks about being slaves. And he... When any time Paul says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, he doesn't mean some guy who waits on tables and he's getting paid at some restaurant. The word servant is the word D-O-U-L-O-S, D-O-U-L-O-S, and it is the word slave. That's the word servant, servant. So Paul says we're slaves, and if we're slaves, we're bound 
We're bound in some respect, or we're limited. You have all these different words, and a lot of them, ha they are, they're synonymous in some meaning. The Jews had so much depth in their understanding. And you get into the word doulos. Well, one of the derivatives of the word doulos is the word dio. And then from dio, that means to bind or bound. Bound. So when you get into all the various meanings of the words uh, for slave or binding or uh, they didn't think of of uh, prison as a penitentiary out here like we do. The Jews didn't. The Jews' laws had no prison sentences. There's not a prison sentence. There's only one prison sentence in, in the Jewish law. The prison is Babylon. The turnkey, that's the man that takes care of the prison. The turn, you've heard me say that God had a turnkey. Well, the turnkey was Nebuchadnezzar. They had no prison sentences because they had no prisons. And the law did not make a reservation for that or any kind of uh, place for prisons. God, would, God had everything, the law had everything set up where there was a penalty. If, you, if your, if your uh, cow broke out of, the, out of a stall and he went out and gored somebody, you had to give him uh, restitution for what he did. If he did it once, you had to pay restitution. The second time if he did it, if he went out and killed somebody and he had done this before, you had to die. Because you knew that he was a wild animal and he'd break loose. You got all these kinds of laws that have to do with binding Israel. They bound Israel to uh, their duty and to their obligations to God. But they had no prisons. And remember, God would send sword, famine, and pestilence against Israel. And finally, after they did not continue to go after uh, Jehovah God, and they would go after Baal in the grove and all these idols, or Hercules and Venus, God says, finally, I will pick you up, I will carry you over here to Babylon, and I will put you in prison over there. And that is my prison. So God has this keeper of the prison. He's Nebuchadnezzar. They don't have prisons in Israel, but he says, you're totally rebellious. I'll pick you up and take you to Babylon, and that's my prison. And that's really the only prison of God. Now, when we talk about uh, the spirits in prison, uh, we're talking about when the Bible says here in verse 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. We've said this so many times. Christ was put to death in the flesh, and he was just, and he was suffering for us, the predestinated elect family of God, the just for the unjust, but. Now, but is a conjunction connecting quickened by the Spirit with put to death in the flesh. When you say but, quickened by the Spirit, but is a, is a conjunction. Quickened, uh, put to death, but quickened. Quickened, zoompo, a o z o o p o i e o. Make alive. Made alive. But the fact that you've got the little conjunction, but means, and of course the quickening doesn't have anything to do with you, anything that you're doing. But the being put to death in the flesh has something to do with what God is doing in us. He causes us to be willing. This is more than just Christ being put to death in the flesh because he says all through here, I'm leaving you an example. In fact, he says that,